All right. So uh, I work for, yeah, I used to be Brandon. Brandon used to be my student back in the day. So back when he was in diapers, it was great. So, <laughs> yeah. So we came, we, my family and I, we moved here back in 07, way back in 07. They had electricity and the internet back then here. And uh, yeah, we just had a great time. It was a fun time being a staff worker. Transitioned out of that. Uh, Brandon came to replace me. Um, then the chapter really took off. And then, uh, so then I um, transitioned to a role where we recruit in church planters to the area, um, just plant churches in a bunch of little towns like around Platteville that really don't have a lot of um, gospel witness there. Uh, then a bunch of the churches in town, like they give me access to train their, um, their people in evangelism and things like that and how to share their faith, faith without being weird, which ironically, I'm the one that teaches them that. So <laughs> anyway, so... Um, yeah, so I have a wife named Becky, and I have three daughters uh, under the age of nine. So it's uh, Leah's nine, Maggie's six, and Gracie's four. Uh, Leah is, um, she reads like a seventh grader. She just reads everything, and she's very analytical and very, like, concrete and everything, like most firstborns. Uh, Maggie is just, like, wears her heart on the sleeve and just, like, is just, she just wants to talk about her feelings a lot. And so she's really, that's my daughter. And then uh, Gracie, she's just uh, uh, she's just a lot of fun. She's a little terror. She vacillates from being a terrorist sometimes to uh, just being like really really fun, <laughs> like other times. So today she was uh, she was more on the terrorist side of the spectrum today. So <laughs> anyway, so anyway, uh, yeah. So this isn't a light and fluffy talk. Sorry, this isn't a light and fluffy talk tonight. Sorry you came tonight. So. Um, yeah, so I saw on fa I saw on the Facebook the kids are on the Facebook these days. So I saw on Facebook that uh, Brandon put something on there. It was like this uh, um, this person like running, like, and it said like leave from idols, come see Aaron Morrow. And I was like, there is nobody that's gonna come. <laughs> like if you can put that on Facebook, I was like, whatever, untag me on that one. Seriously, <laughs> good night. So anyway. So how about we pray, and then we'll get started. So God, we're really thankful for you most of all, and um, we're thankful that um, the gospel brings clarity to the clutteredness of our hearts, and um, yeah, we're just really thankful for you, and we just pray for um, all kind of demonic stuff that you'll just like clear um, our hearts and hear clear the room of, of that kind of stuff, and we pray that your purposes will go forth tonight, and that will be, be a good trajectory based on this talk. So please use me in that way, and we love you. Amen. All right, so this semester you've been going through 1 Corinthians. So 1 Corinthians, that's like a fairly large-sized book in the New Testament. So um, one of the things that um, – I haven't been here in like four years, okay? So like it's not like I've been here for the whole 1 Corinthians series or anything like that. But I'm assuming because I've read 1 Corinthians that um, – there's a lot of stuff in there that um, can sometimes make us uncomfortable. But the reason why, one way that we know that we've encountered a real God instead of the f a figment of our imagination is when the God that we read about in the Bible makes us uncomfortable sometimes. So that's a good thing. It's not necessarily a bad thing. So if you've been uncomfortable just a little bit going through some of the topics, that's a good thing. It's like that's how we grow. That's how we know we've met the God of the Bible. So the book of 1 Corinthians assumes, if you read, all <laughs> read through it, if you haven't done that on your own, I'd really you know, that'd be a great thing for you to do. The book of 1 Corinthians assumes that God knows the best way for me to live and how to orient my life. So the book of 1 Corinthians assumes that God knows the best way for me to live and how to orient my life. You see that all throughout the chapters of the book. If there is a God, you don't just invite someone like that to give you advice. If there is a God, you instead sur are supposed to surrender to him and let him govern your life. If there is a God, and that means that we are underqualified for the job as master and commander of our own lives. If there is a God, then that makes sense that he would know some things about what's best for me that maybe I can't necessarily understand. 
And like when we hear things like that, maybe that just sounds really restricting and like cuz and just really makes us feel uncomfortable and just like is God just trying to ruin our lives and things like that. But um you know, and maybe you know, and maybe that is restricting. In a lot of ways it is. You know, because uh, you know, I was thinking about this week. It's just like we would much rather have freedom than restrictions. Because after all, like um, all of us are sitting here right now, and we aren't living in our mom's basement right now. Because one of the reasons why s- a lot of us came to college, except for some people, <laughs> but some p- like one of the reasons why most of us came to college is because we wanted to get out of from under, away from our parents, w- away from restrictions, so we could experience freedom, because that's where life and purpose and meaning happen. I would submit to you that real freedom is found in finding the right restrictions. If you're looking for freedom, real freedom is found in finding the right restrictions. So let's pretend... Let's think about a fish right now. Of all things we could talk about, let's talk about a fish. So pretend like there's this extremely ambitious, self-aware fish that's swimming in the Little Platte River, like behind Los Amigos. No, no, what's the other Mexican restaurant? Whatever that one is down there. Ah, Los Palma, whatever. (laughs) They're all the same. (laughs) They're all wonderful. (laughs) (laughs) So let's pretend there's a fish down there. And this extremely self-aware fish says to himself, I am sick of this water. There's a big world out there. And I'm sick of being restri- my having my freedom restricted by this water. And I'm going to get out of here. So that fish, in all his ambitious glory, s- swims up to the side of the stream and jumps out and flaps its way like onto the grass. And he thinks to himself, that I knew there was a big world out here. And I knew that finally I'm free away from that stream where that water was. There's a big world out here and now I finally have freedom. And we all know that's, ob- that's obviously ridiculous because a fish was designed for water. A fish was not designed for land. Real freedom is about finding the right restrictions and that's in, al- in alignment with you how you're designed. So in the passage that we're going to be looking at tonight you know, in 1 Corinthians 10, just a short couple of verses that we're going to be looking at. Um, we didn't have time to go into the larger context. I would have loved to do that for you tonight, but we just don't have time. So in the passage that we're going to be looking at, um, we see a glimpse, a snapshot into like, how we were designed by God. What kind of restrictions are there that are meant for our freedom? So in this c- in this passage, we're going to be looking at it's like we see that we weren't designed to fill our hearts with idols. We weren't designed to fill our hearts with idols. So what's an idol? So I I mean I haven't been here through all the talks through First Corinthians, but you know. Th- I'm assuming at some point it's been talked about how, you know, it was a very religious culture in the city of Corinth back then, and there were just, like, little temples everywhere throughout the city where there were just shrines where people would walk in and just, like, bow down to this idol, this, like, God who was, like, pretend, but man, it's like, this God's awesome. And then, like, those were idols and everything. And what we see in the New Testament is that um, the New Testament broadens our understanding of idols, where it's not just a place that we go to or a physical thing that we bow down to or w- something like that. It, idols actually like are intangible things or ideas or thoughts or things that just like take hold in our heart. An idol is anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. It's anything that you seek to g- it's anything you seek to give you what only God can give you. It's anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God and anything you seek to give you what only God can give you. And all right, so 
I'm assuming there's some freshmen in here, so like that means a lot of you aren't. So think for yourself way back when you were a freshman, like all those years ago, maybe it was last year even, you were in Ivy League. And in Ivy League, which is kind of like a freshman program group thing, whatever. So in Ivy League, one thing they probably talked about was the heart. And now the heart is one of the meta narratives like throughout the entirety of scripture and that you know the heart is mentioned like a few hundred times and it's you know when popular culture talks about the heart whether it's a song or on the bachelor or something like that you know you watch the bachelor you know what i'm talking about <laughs> when the when they talk about the heart they're talking about their feelings and emotions follow your heart you're it's talking about that kind of stuff and that can be confusing sometimes when you read the Bible because when the Bible uses the word heart, it means something much broader and just bigger and grand, just a larger scale than just our feelings and emotions. It is that, but it's way more than that. It just encompasses everything about who we are on the inside. It's like in the heart in the Bible, it's the sum, total, and utter essence of everything that we are. So it matters what's ruling the culture of your heart. It matters what's ruling the culture of your heart. It matters because the culture of your heart will be eventually become the culture of your life because that just kind of spills out. It's like whatever is on the inside, it just kind of spills out. The culture of your life will become the culture of your relationships. And if you want to be a leader in any kind of capacity, whether it's an IV or just a marketplace leader after you graduate, whatever it is, your family, whatever it is, it's like, of course, like, it's going to affect your leadership because leadership is about more than just relationships, but it's never about less than relationships. The culture of your heart just dictates the course of your life. Idols are a big deal because if you... Idols are a big deal because if you need, like, capital N, need something in addition to God in order to bring meaning and purpose and life makes sense if I have that in addition to God. And that the Bible categorizes that as an idol. That's what's holding jurisdiction in your life, whether you realize it or not. So Brandon, if you want to go to the chart right now, the chart. Some of us are engineers. We like charts. Isn't that nice? So, um, I'm going to be going through a few things in a chart right here. Um, if you want to, um, there's going to be handouts like with this chart on it in the back. So after you leave, if you want to pick this up and um, check it out, you totally can. So now the premise of this is that there are four primary idols that you can trace them all the way through the Bible. Every problem that happens in scripture, every like thing that goes on in scripture, it's like you can trace these all the way through. Power, approval, comfort, control. Power, approval, comfort, control. So if you want to do the first one, power. So power, success, winning, influence. Life only has me if this like when this idol of power like resides and like has jurisdiction in your heart it's like life only has meaning and you only have worth when like you have power and influence over others like life is just makes sense when like i have that You know, your ideas need to go through. Like, my, like this is what's right. This people need to stop being stupid. They just need to get their life in order. I, even if it's for a good reason, like, life makes sense when this happens. The greatest nightmare is being humiliated and just, like, oh, it's just, like, that just drives them. It's just, like, these people are just, like, just, you know, just hard drivers and they work hard and it's just, like, they don't want to be humiliated. The problem with that is that people around them often feel used because, like, they're the pawn. They feel like the pawns in that person's game of power and just, like, trying to change people and, like, have influence and everything like that. Pro their problem emotion is often anger. You know, people, people who I know, they um, struggle with, like, the idol of power. Um, 
usually they say something along the lines of like, well, I'm not, I don't get angry, I'm just passionate. It's like, oh, like, the Bible would call that anger, because I can see, like, your blood, at your blood pressure is raising, rising, you know, <laughs> so, so next one, approval, affirmation, love, relationships, I am love, like, life has meaning, and you only have worth, and life just makes sense when you are, like, loved and respected by blank, and this could be a horrible person that you don't even like and respect, this could be a wonderful person like your mom who likes making you brownies and sends them to you, okay? So there was a, there's this old story about uh, Larry David. He was the creator of Seinfeld, and uh, he is extremely well-known, and, like, people can recognize him on the spot in New York City because he's just, like, um, he was a big deal there. So in New um, a lot of Seinfeld episodes happened in Yankee Stadium, so Larry David went to a Seinfeld, or w he went to the Yan a Yankee, a Yankees game at Yankee Stadium and they showed him on the Jumbotron and 50,000 people just saw him and just erupted like <laughs> I mean I don't know if I'd like erupt in <laughs> like that with Larry David but man it was just like people were just 50,000 people just erupted it was just awesome and the story goes that when he was leaving Yankee Stadium there's one guy who like he he saw Larry from a distance and yelled out, Hey, Larry, you suck. And his friends said, Larry David's friends said that when he got in the car, like that's the only thing that he could talk about was that one guy. Approval. And greatest nightmare is rejection, whether it's be from like someone we don't even respect or like or like whatever. It's like, or if it's someone we love. And it's a lot of times, like, people feel smothered because, you know, they're just, like, so, like, trying so hard and deeply to get, like, um, unanimous approval from everybody and trying to make everyone happy around them. And, you know, it's just, like, sometimes that can just, you can just feel smothered by that. And problem emotion, cowardice. You know, being a leader is, like, if this is the operating... Um, if this idol is operational in your heart, um, it sometimes it's really hard to be a leader because, um, man, like, like getting a hundred percent like unanimity on everything and having everyone be happy with you at all times, like, man, you just, um, it's hard to lead people when you're scared of them and you want them to like really like you and you need that in order for like your identity to be fulfilled. Sometimes, like, um, I know Brandon talks about fear of man. It's like, that's what this is talking about with approval. So next one, comfort. Privacy, lack of stress, freedom. Like, life only has, like, meaning and, like, life makes sense and, like, you have worth. Like, when you have this certain kind of pleasure or experience or, like, a particular quality of life. So people who just throw themselves into their hobbies and throw themselves into like, I'm not sure how to get specific to get here. Um, I want to get specific, but I won't. But like, man, it's just like, there are just like certain kind of pleasure experiences that you can have like just uh, physically or just like, man, just how you use your time with just like throwing yourself into things. And just, like, man, stress and demands are just the worst thing that you could think of. Like, whatever you can do to avoid those kind of things. Man, it's just, like, life makes sense when my comfort is just, like, just front and center. If you're a leader or have any kind of responsibilities and comfort is, like, really set in your heart, um, yeah, people often feel neglected. Because, like, you're just like, man, like, I just had to play six hours of Call of Duty. Like, I just had to do this. I had to do that. I had to do, you know, like, what was most pleasurable to me for me at that point. People who just complain and lament about being bored all the time, it's just like that might be a good indicator that, like, this is operational in your heart. Because life only makes sense when just things are going m like my time, my way. This is like why first time dads that I disciple, and like I know this because I was there, 
<laughs> this is why first time dads often have a really, really hard time because like uh, life is not about you anymore. Like your comfort, you can doing whatever you want, whenever you want, that just doesn't happen anymore because you have a kid right there. Next one, control. Self-discipline, certainty, standards. Um, life only makes sense and you only have worth and life just makes sense like if you're able to get mastery over, cer over as certain aspects of your life. Like, every, like, I am not going to cry in front of you because that would mean that I would be out of control and I can't control how you're perceiving me and I will control how everyone perceives me and like sees me and just like I will control all the circumstances in my life to eliminate the uncertainty of what goes on in my life. Life will make sense because I will determine the outcome of what's going to happen. People often feel condemned around people who like struggle with like the idol of control because they just the ship is wound so tight like around them of just like how people are <laughs> um, it's like things need to be done a certain way and like it needs to be done like this and like people just like sometimes just like like draw away from that it's just like I can't live up to this person's standards and I'm just going to withdraw and I feel really judged and condemned and I'm just gonna move away and people like who struggle with control they look like just the you know, the pictures often they look like the picture of just like control and things are together on the outside but if like you could see the inner dialogue in their head they're just worry and worry and worry and worry because not everything is under control if you're a leader and you struggle with control um, you probably gravitate toward, you are probably somewhere on the isolation spectrum because if things can only be done a certain way, eventually what happens is that you just have to do everything then because this has to get done this way. These are the overarching idols that transcend every people group of every culture and ever of all time. You go through, you go to social media, you go to the Bible, you go to celebrity culture, read current events, read the newspaper, read the New York Times, re <laughs> like listen to music and like what people are saying and thinking and doing and like like the narratives that are coming from like what you're listening to. It's like you can hear these idols and they may not say it like this and like some kind of fancy engineer chart, but like this is where it, this is like the things that are like there. Read your history textbook in your classroom. It's like these like transcend history. And not only that, like they're operational in our hearts. Um, random side notes. Um, Sometimes people a um, ask me what the difference is between power and control. Um, control a lot of times has to do with like controlling my immediate surroundings and myself and how people are perceiving this. Uh, power usually has, con like you wanna control other people. So um, in my experience, um, this isn't meant to sound chauvinistic at all whatsoever, but women a lot of times um, struggle with control that is not a gender specific idol up there, for sure. But a lot of time, I have a lot of theories about why that is. I can't prove a lot of theories that I can't prove. Um, approval. People who struggle with approval, um, usually those are the people who are quickest to recognize their idol. So a lot of th um, those of us out there who struggle with like approval. Um, when I was explaining that right there, you were probably immediately were like, that's me, that's me. Okay. Um, people who struggle with power often have the hardest time, in my experience, uh, recognizing their own idol. Um, by de in my opinion, um, by definition, I would, ex I would contend that that's because by the definition, people who struggle with the idol of power um, they're so busy uh, 
recognizing how other people are suck and are wrong and things like that, that they aren't like self-reflective enough to see like how um, something might be operational in their own heart with that. So um, some might object, I mean, some of you might object to just like saying like, these aren't all bad things. Like, what are you talking about? It's like, I can't like self-control is like the fruit of the spirit, knucklehead. It's like, that's so true. And like, oh, I'm not supposed to have any comfort ever. And like, oh, I shouldn't care what anybody thinks. It's like, I would totally agree with all that. The thing that I would encourage you to think through is like, why does that need, those things need to be present in order for there to be meaning and um, and just worth and life makes sense when those things are there. It's not bad to be like have somebody like you. It totally isn't. What are you kidding me? Have you read the Bible? Do you have co- any common sense? Of course, that's a good thing. But like when that becomes something that you need, capital N, in order for have life to make sense, that's like when that's something that needs to get addressed. Sometimes people say, um, I've heard people say like, oh, well, you know, this is just my personality. Um, you know, you can't change, I can't change who I am. This is just who I am. Um, you know, and I like personality. This isn't meant to be Aaron's ranting session here. Um, I do have the microphone, though. Um, (laughs) I like the Myers-Briggs assessment. Probably a lot of you have done that. I like Myers-Briggs. I like strength finders. If you haven't done that, that's really good. I like that whole prophet, priest, king thing. Okay, I like that. You should keep doing those things. From a Christian perspective, though, um, here's the downside to those things. Personality assessments do a great job of explaining your personality. What they don't do is explain how your personality is depraved and how your personality isn't in alignment with the gospel. Keep doing those personality tests, but um, there are limitations to them. Um, Yeah, and you know, what I've always found is that like uh, the idol that I'm, um, the idol that is most destructive in my life is usually the one that I'm most defensive about. So this usually, I may not be the only one here, so with that, but. So what's the way of, uh, so that's the problem. So we've diagnosed the problem. So what does scripture say about like, what is the way out of that? So, so 1 Corinthians 10, 13 through 14. Verse 13, no temptation is overtaking you that is not common to man. And we just read, like, we just looked at that chart, and it's just like, I mean, that's common to everybody. It's like, I can see all four of them. There's some in in that chart that, like, are more prevalent in my heart that I'm more tempted by than others. But, man, this is like, they're all there in my life. And I remember praying to God uh, like uh, several months ago, and I was like, you know, it's like I feel like all of them except power are really prevalent in me, God. And like I just, you know, it's just interesting to me, you know, because I just say things like that to God apparently. And um, yeah, and and uh, it was over the next week. Uh, I long story short. I just felt very (laughs) convicted that, like, yeah, there are certain areas in my life that, (laughs) like, power is, like, an idol in my heart in certain situations. And it's, like, no temptation has seized me that's not common to man. It's, like, these are all, like, things that, like, like, weave their way through the, like, humanity. It just is. The important thing, though, is, like, right there, God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability but when with the temp- but with the temptation he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it therefore in light of like there's an escape ha- there's an escape route somewhere for there there's always going to be an escape therefore my beloved flee from idolatry Just flee from it like don't let that be in your heart 
So if the way of if there's always a way of escape, and it's a fair question to ask, like what is the way of escape then? At the most basic level, the way we flee from idolatry is by escaping through Christ. At the most basic level, it's like the way we flee from idolatry is by escaping through Christ. You know, yeah, and just like when we're tempted to just like have find life has meaning and we have worth and just like life just makes sense with that, it's just like the solution to that isn't to just like try really hard, you know, to just like do this or that. Like, I mean, there is effort, duh. But like the thing that you need to do is just really find your identity in Jesus and not <laughs> in that. And that is easier said than done, but like that is the escape route that God provides. The gospel is the way that like we do that. You know, Jesus lived the life that we were supposed to live. He died the death that we were supposed to die. All my idolatry that was like where I put my hope and identity and trust and like meaning and all that kind of stuff. Like that was like, that was in some like spiritual kind of way, like that was transferred onto Jesus. Like that was punished. Jesus was punished for that because he was able to endure that. He came back alive, you know, because like he was victorious over that because like, um, because he's God and I'm not. And like, because of that, you know, I have right standing with God now. He's given me a new nature that I don't deserve because I think about things and I care about things and I can't think about God when I just didn't before. I have a new nature, I have a new standing, that none of which I deserve. And on top of that, the icing on the cake is that we have a new identity. If you're a Christian, you have a new identity because you put your faith in Christ. And having a new identity in Christ is what gets us out of this kind of stuff. To place our, like, our faith and our trust and, like, in, like, instead of those things, like, with comfort, I power, control, and approval. If you uproot an idol in your life and fail to plant the gospel in its place, that idol just grows back. It's like, you know, like if there's just if you just leave this cavernous space with just like you just get rid of it out of self effort, it just grows back. That's just the way it works, unfortunately. But God like wants to like take that place right there because He wants the credit and the glory for that. It's for getting you out of that. Um, God. God's knowledge of us and how our how these idols like are operational in our hearts. God's knowledge of us doesn't keep us keep him from loving us. And I just speak from personal experience. These kind of idols that we talked about just now, like the rabbit hole goes way deeper than you think it does in like your heart and life and areas just everything it just really does if it doesn't with you you are probably the only person i've ever met that it doesn't and even though god knows all of that that doesn't keep him from loving us we are so bad that jesus had to die for us and we're, we're so loved that Jesus was happy to die for us. Um, I wouldn't expect extremely rapid growth with this kind of stuff. Like, here, um, here's my suggestion. This is just my suggestion. You can chuck it if you want. It's just like anything else I've said. Um, I would suggest um, for the next couple weeks, just pray on a regular basis. God, can you just show me, like, how this stuff is just, like, operational in my life? Because, like, if you can just show me, and, like, please guard me from, like, con condemning myself when you show me some of this stuff. Like, just please help me to just see this stuff through the light of the gospel and my identity in Christ. Please guard me from that. But just, why don't you just ask him that, like, to just show you some of that? Like, he's gracious. He won't show you everything. <laughs> like, that's great like 
I'm 36. I'm really old. Like, and I still keep seeing, like, stuff where, like, areas of my life that this stuff is just operational. I'm like, gosh, I am so glad that he didn't show me everything all at once because I would have, uh, that just wouldn't have been good. <laughs> He's patient with us. Over time, you'll know that the Spirit of God is growing you in these areas when your desires for Jesus and the gospel begin to defy your desires for power, approval, comfort, and control. That's so encouraging. It's like, don't get, fr- don't measure your spiritual growth in this, when this kind of stuff, in terms of like a week to week or day by day kind of thing. Like, you just, like, that just isn't a good idea. Like, take a long term approach. Like, if you're 21, just wait till you're 22 and just like, I'm just going to look back when I was 21 and just see where God's taken me from there. <laughs> How has he like cha- been changing my desires for these things? How is the gospel more operational in my heart? When you get to be 30, look back even more. When you get to be 40, it's like, okay, God really gets credit because I was a real piece of work in ways that I didn't even realize. <laughs> and make sure you ask him to um, show you how to like, in practical ways, how to trust him and just to help you to just like to turn from that stuff and just really see him as the treasure that's like because he's patient and loving with us in ways that like we don't even know <laughs> we can't even understand I would encourage you also to like um, talk about this stuff in your witnessing community and like and obviously when it comes to talking about this stuff I didn't write down that I was going to talk about this um, if you choose to talk about this with other people um some of us need to know that, like, we can't nag each other into spiritual growth. Um, I don't think it's wise to impose ourselves on other people either. It's like, do you want me to show you and tell you everything, <laughs> like, every issue that I see in you? But I would encourage you in your, when the time is right, um, I would encourage you sometime this semester um, to have one or two friends to just really be talking to and just, like, um, just ask ask them, and these have to be people that you'd really trust. Um, like, can you tell me about like what you see in me, and just with this kind of stuff? And can you even pray about that for a week before you talk to me about that? That would be even better. And just like have that kind of con- those kind of conversations with each other about that. That affects your mission. That affects um, your walk with Jesus. That affects everything about you. So as a witnessing community, just like encourage you to seek the grace of God together when it comes to this kind of stuff. So let's pray. God, we're really thankful that um, your knowledge of us doesn't keep you from loving us. And in fact, you're excited to love us and um, want to pour out your grace on us. And we just ask, Holy Spirit, that you'll just... Um, be applying the gospel in just really helpful um, and helpful ways to us, and like we know that um, you're be you're beyond you're infinitely wise and infinitely complex, and like so there's ways that you're going to be growing us over the next few years um, um, in ways and when it comes to this stuff to uh, in ways that we actually need it, God. So we're just really thankful for you, and we love you. Amen.